The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Van Dusen, Director of Alumni Career Development at Holy Cross, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is the next installment in our series of web-based presentations covering a broad range of career development topics. Today, I'm excited to welcome Katie Donovan, Holy Cross Class of 1985. Katie is an equal pay consultant who works with individuals so they can negotiate an equitable employment package. She also consults with employers so they can eliminate unintended biases in hiring, promotion, and pay raise processes. You can find out more about her work at EqualPayNegotiations.com. We'll be together for a little under an hour. Katie will speak and will then take questions from you for as long as time allows. I encourage you to submit questions throughout this presentation by checking out the question function located on your webinar toolbar to the right. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Katie. Thanks, Ginny, and thanks everyone for spending some time with us today. As Ginny said, I focus on equal pay. I work with um, individuals and companies. Just to give you a little more detail so you can figure out what weight to give to my recommendations today, I used to work in staffing and I also worked for an applicant tracking company, one of those black holes when you apply online to a job. So I know the inside story and that's I really use that from working with everything from small mom and pop to nonprofit to mid-size to international Fortune 500. Um, and these are just some of the groups I've worked with or media that's covered me. So that gives you an idea of you know, what grain of salt you want to use in what we talk about today. So we'll cover why negotiation, then give you actual lines you can use in the negotiation. And as Ginny said, there'll be time for Q&A. About 10 minutes is what we're, 10, 15 minutes is what it should come out with, unless I ramble too much. So why should you negotiate? Well, there's been estimates done by a few different places, and based on the average income in America, which is at roughly 54000 for nothing else other than negotiating, the only change, you don't have to change career paths, you don't have to change jobs every two years, you just do what you're doing now and add negotiating to it, you can make a million dollars more during your career. For the women on the call and also people of color, unfortunately, the likelihood is you're experiencing a gender pay gap or a racial pay gap, and negotiating will help you overcome and close your own personal pay gap from that. And then the other part of it is we all, after we graduated Holy Cross and either didn't go back to college from there or went on to graduate school, once we graduated, we thought we were done with grades. But in the working world, your pay is very much considered your grade. People don't talk about it that way, but when you apply for things, if you're not making the right amount of money, you're looked at as, as less than. So if you're not negotiating, you're not getting yourself into the right level of pay to be deemed an A candidate. So it's very important to help you in moving through the corporate ladder. Uh, one example of how it's not too, too hard to do, and that it really does create this extra money. Uh, one of my clients a while back, she, we discovered she was amazingly underpaid. She was making just about 60000 at the time. We were able to negotiate a little more than 20000 for her in a raise, but during the process she realized how underpaid she was, went and got a new job, negotiated that, then got another raise, and within two years, she tripled her income. So that's how negotiation can really impact all of the things discussed here. So when is it expected? Because it is expected. About 84% of hiring managers expect it, which means they're not that first offer is never the best offer. They're holding money to the side. So every time you get a new job, definitely negotiate it. Doesn't mean you're always going to be successful but you need to negotiate. Performance reviews, although they're a dying entity, the annual performance review probably in five to 10 years will be completely gone. It's a good time to practice. You may get 1% more. You're not gonna get a ton more because those are budgeted so far in advance. 
things that happen more often that you can address as they occur. Uh, your job description and what you're actually doing probably have nothing to do with each other because of a thing called job creep. Every day your manager a week or a month is giving you something new. That impacts what you should be paid. Promotions without new money, never, never, never accept that. Um, bigger things, market value. Every year I say review what your job is worth, just like going to the doctor for an annual checkup. Check that out because your job, like a house, has an ever-changing market and you want to check that out. And then you also want to make sure you're keeping with inflation. So those are really good times to have the conversation. And it's best when it's off-cycle from the performance review. Everyone thinks they have to wait to that. That's actually the worst time. The method of negotiation that I am a fan of is called collaborative negotiations. You may have heard it as win-win. I'm a fan of it for two reasons. One, it's been shown to be the type of negotiation that women do very well and is not perceived as us being witchy. There is a witch factor when, although we're expected to negotiate when we do, while well, what a, and I won't say the real word, she is. So collaborative helps negate that. It's also the style or technique of negotiation that is really most effective in business because it hits all these things, his goals, his relationships, you, you're building your reputation, all of that stuff is important. So, and when we talk about collabor collaborative negotiations, it's really about questions and answers and, uh, and discovering the other side's needs and not walking in and saying, how dare you offer me 50,000, I need 65. Total opposite of that. And I'll give language examples later on in the um, webinar. So what determines what the job should pay? There's a lot of talk about knowing your worth. I absolutely hate that with a passion. I don't want you to know what you're worth. I want you to know what your job is worth because you're the same person regardless when you change from, hey, I'm a marketing manager to, hey, I'm a marketing VP. You did not change but the market for the job and the title changes. So that's, as I have it in this graphic, the bottom or the base of the pyramid. And it's probably about 50% of the total value of the overall compensation. That's the biggest determining factor. And we'll show how to do the research and what the market is in your geography. You know, it's different from Boston to San Francisco to, um, to Frankfurt, Kentucky. You need to be aware of what's going on there. The other determining factor in what your job should pay you is who you're working for and their ability and their philosophy of pay. So if you've ever gone to like a salary.com or one of the other online sites that give you salary research, there'll be a bell curve or some kind of graphic showing you what people are paying. Some companies have the philosophy that we always want to pay the absolute highest amount. Golden handcuffs get the best of the best, and when they get sick of us, they won't be able to leave because no one else is going to be able to pay them the same. And that works for some companies. Then there are other companies, and many of us work for these other companies when we first graduated, they get the inexperienced and pay them very little because they're inexperienced. But you stay there for two years, three years, and then you move on and go to one of those middle companies, which is where the vast majority of companies live in their philosophy. We're going to pay an appropriate average amount for what's out there. So the majority live in kind of that high part of the bell curve. But the ability to pay a good year or a bad year, you're, you can't control that in your negotiations. The company either has the money or they don't. And that is something you can research as well, and we'll talk about that. So those two things combined are probably about 80% of the decision of what can this job pay. You, the person filling it, is the final part of the puzzle. And your credentials are maybe 20, 25% of that decision. So starting with what you're worth eliminates the key aspects of what the job should actually pay. So don't start there. 
that's the last part of the whole puzzle. Start with the other two and you'll do much better. Because if you're working for one of those companies that pays low, if you're not aware of all the other things, you'll never know to just go change jobs and that's where you, you'll get better pay. You also need to be aware, both men and women, that there is a gender pay gap and there is a racial pay gap. So when you do your research, it is going to include all these different groups that are paid less. And we really, you know, when you figure out your target pay, you basically want to get paid what the higher end people are getting paid, which statistically are men and statistically are Asian and white men. So that's kind of where we want to aim, if at all possible. So now statistics come in. Um, I was not great at statistics at Holy Cross, but I enjoyed it. And now I use it all the time, which kills me. So the gender pay gap, and this is based on weekly income, is about 81%. It varies from industry and job. The U.S. Department of Labor covers over 500 jobs, about 10 of them. Women make the same or more than men, all the others less. So knowing that it varies will impact how you have to adjust your research. I'll give you an example. So I pulled, this is information from Glassdoor, a financial planner salaries. In the country, the national average is 60000 So now you're feeling very proud of yourself that you did the research and know I should aim for a minimum of 60000 because I went to Holy Cross. I'm better than average. Unfortunately, knowing that there's a gap, if you aim for $60,000, you are you're aiming too low. You can't aim for that $62,000. The max they show for the na nation is $103,000. If you look at, look, I wonder what the men are making, it's almost $81,000. And this is based on what the Gender pay gap is for finance, which is one of the bigger gaps. It's 58 cents on the dollar women are making. And then the percentage of people doing financial planning that are men and a, that are women. And that's how that number was generated. I don't expect everyone to be able to do that kind of math on their own. Um, just always aim much, much higher than you think you should be, and you'll be okay. In the negotiation, as I talked about before, it's a collaborative approach that you want to be, which means both parties, you as the employee and the employer, can be happy. And I think of this as three numbers. Both of you have three numbers in your mind. At least you as a candidate or as an employee should. You have the walk away or the lowest amount. So if you're a current employee looking to get a raise, this means your walk away is, sheesh, they better not take any money away from you. It's what you're making today. If you're a candidate, the walk away, from my perspective, should always be at least the average in your research. That should be your walk away. But then again, you know, sometimes you take a job just to keep a roof over your head. So that you're kind of in charge of figuring out what that is. The goal should be a number that's appropriate for what the market is, for what your research with the company is, and for what your credentials bring it up to. And we'll talk about all three of those parts. And then the counter needs to be higher than your goal. If, if you think you should be making 80000 in that job, you can't say 80000 because they'll offer you 70, maybe 75. You need to say 90 to 100 type of thing. At the same time, the employer has three numbers in his or her mind. One is what I'm going to initially offer you. Usually, nine times out of ten, this is 10% more than what you're currently making. I do this really stupid kind of sideshow game when I get new clients. They, when they tell me what they're making now, I can estimate what they made at their last job. I'm always within one to $2,000. It's, I don't care what they tell you they do with the compensation specialists. If they know what you're making, they're adding 10% on, and that's the initial offer. We'll talk about how not to do that. <laughs> they then have the expected, which could be different. And then they have the budget, which is really what the company's already said. 
is what they're going to pay for the job. Bigger companies, this can be a range. Smaller companies, it can just be, hey, can we afford up to 60 grand for this job? But no job is actually a job opening without it being approved and budgeted. That was what I learned day one in staffing, what I learned every day after that. My manager just drilled it into you. And it is an eye-opener to be aware of that. You do not have to tell them what they should be paying you. They already know what they can afford to pay and what the job should pay because they've paid other people to do that before. As long as you get to the goal or above and stay at the budget or below, both of you walk away very happy and content. So as long as you have a professional conversation and don't get overheated about it, there's really no bad feelings on any side. It's very doable. I would say nine out of 10 of my clients send an email or a phone call and say, I can't believe how relaxed the conversation actually was. Because all of us kind of work up in our mind that it's this big vicious fight from TV make-believe scenes. Not like that at all. Pay is not the only thing though. Don't forget the benefits. You know, from commission and bonuses, whether or not they have any educational reimbursement, trade association memberships are great, um, flexibility. The one that I have is the very bottom here, success resources, is the most overlooked and probably the most important for your career. Are they giving you the right budget to get what you need done? Are they getting you the right employees for you to manage to get what's done? Uh, are, are everything you need in place so that you can be successful? Because if you negotiate a million dollars more, but the company puts no money into supporting what you're doing, you're going to fail and be out the door within a year anyway. So don't forget the success resources and try to think those three through. More important as you move up in your career than as your entry levels, but those are critical when you're negotiating a new job or even just promotions or within your current job. So now let's get down to the brass tacks, the language and the parts of the negotiation. The negotiation absolutely positively starts when you're applying for the job. Job applications more often than not ask the question, what are you making now and what did you make in your previous jobs? Remember I mentioned the grading system as your pay, this is where that comes into play. So they'll have, where are you working, what's the title, what's the pay, what's the year. You do not want to answer that. It can only hurt you. You're making too little, they don't think you're good enough. You're making too much, they won't be able to afford you, and they move on to someone else. What you want to do, if you're talking to them, say, I'm so sorry, but it's confidential. That is actually accurate for about 60% of you who work in private sector jobs. If you work for the government, it's public knowledge what your pay is. Someone can track it down, so that doesn't work. Um, but otherwise, you can get away with playing this. You, didn't have, you may not have confidentiality with your pay at your current employer, but they don't know that. So you can get away with it in the gamemanship of a negotiation, because there is a lot of gamemanship in it. Don't feel like this is a bad answer. It actually is kind of brilliant in its simplicity because you're proving that you're going to actually honor any agreement you sign with them. And a future employer should not be mad when you're actually honoring agreements with your current employer. If they have an issue with that, you probably want to rethink actually working for them. If this answer does not work, because there's definitely situations where this answer does not work, a fallback and a really good one is, well, I'm not sure why it's relevant. And this can be for many reasons. I, I, I'm aware I was underpaid, so I'm not sure how relevant it would be. That's kind of a coded answer saying, like, don't think you can just throw $10,000, 10% on to my previous pay, because that's not going to fly. I know I was underpaid. You're basically making that statement without making it. Or you got a new degree, or you're changing industries, or maybe you're going from nonprofit to for-profit. 
so you're not sure how relevant it is. It's opening the conversation and then saying, well, explain why it is relevant to you. And that's that co collaborative approach of asking questions more than demanding things. Now, as we all know when we're applying for jobs, that question is on the online application and sometimes you hit the submit button and that big horrific exclamation mark comes up and says, warning, 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 you missed some required fields. Just enter 0.00. .00. More often than not, those applications are just looking for a number. So entering 0.00, .00 gets it in. The recruiters know you were just bypassing it. They're not assuming you're making nothing. They will ask you the questions on your call, on the screening call. So be ready for it. They hate blanks, but answering that can only hurt you. So try not to. If you have to, don't worry. It's okay, it gets easier with practice. The second question on the application, which is absolutely a negotiation question, is what are you looking to make? What's your desired pay? Once again, on an online application, if it's a required field, put it blank, zero, 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 zero dot zero, zero, and have the conversation with the phone screen or wherever it pops up. The first response, I don't know enough about the job to know what it should pay. Remember, we have the market and then the company's philosophy. It's not about your bills. It's not about what you're making today. It's what's that job valued at that company is what it should be paying. And that's kind of a mental switch. Um, but you, you need to get comfortable with this sentence. Definitely practice it. It's a, it's a really valuable sentence especially early on. It helps to push the conversation further down. Another way to word it, what are you looking to make? Well, I'd love to make a million dollars, and you have to say it very kind of kiddingly. Well, I'd love to make a million dollars, but you know, I'll take a competitive package. Once again, you're being professional, you're being polite, but you're also not being aggressive. The beauty part of this sentence is that there's been research with saying that kiddingly I'd love to make a million dollars. It actually anchors your offer higher. Offers have been shown to come in higher if you say this. And I just noticed a typo. Apologies on that. Um, so that's another good one. You kind of play around with what you're most comfortable with. Now, if you're doing the negotiation for a new job, your gut reaction, your excitement is the second they offer you the job, you want to just say yes or negotiate right then and there. And that's the absolute wrong move. You want to pull yourself out of the moment, calm down, you know, have a little victory dance that you got the job offer, and then actually sit down and look at the whole offer and figure out if it's good or not for you and what you're missing. Healthcare alone can totally change what you think is a $10,000 increase in pay to less than $4,000 if you're going from a company paying all of the premiums to a company paying 50% and their packages aren't as good and have high deductibles. So you really do have to just step back, spend a day or so looking at everything. I highly recommend getting the employee handbook as well and asking for any other papers you need to sign because you don't know about non-competes, confidentiality, whatever it is, you want to see what's going on so you're aware of it and that you're not showing up on the first day of work and realizing you're supposed to be signing away your life. So this is a great way, really excited, love the job, can I get back to you Monday, Tuesday, whatever. Job offers are usually good for a week, just confirm that. Do not go radio silent on them. Um, I had one client reach out to me, after, well, almost became a client, when he forgot to get back in touch with them. Well, it was good for a week, waited till the 11th hour, and they said, well, we haven't heard from you, so we went to the next candidate. You know, don't do that. 
when you then get back to them, so now you've done your research, you looked at everything, you call back, and even if it's triple what you expect, you're going to be dissatisfied. Wow, I'm so excited about the job offer, eh, but it seems low based on my research. And where you're going to do your research, there's three different areas I like to do. First, the online stuff. Indeed is another great place to do research because they base their numbers on what's actually in job advertisements. Uh, a lot of companies will give you pushback because salary.com, Payscale, and Glassdoor are based on what employees put in. And for some reason, they think we're all lying. Um, so Indeed is another one to add. Trade associations, I used to work for one. We, every year, did an annual um, survey to find out what's going on in that industry and then share it with the members. So check out your trade association or professional association. If you don't know what it is, just Google whatever your job is and then put the words professional association. You'll find local and regional and international and national and all kinds of combinations. There's amazing how many are out there. And then for people who are staying in the same type of job, if you're still a round peg going into a round hole, a headhunter is a great, great resource. They're not when you're trying to change career paths, but when you're doing the same work, call them and say like, hey, I'm an accounting manager making 65000 Can I do better? And they say, oh my gosh, we have openings all the time paying 80000 and more. Send us your resume. We'll see if we have anything and can work with you. And you accomplished two things. You found out what the going rate is for your job, and you created the beginnings of a new option. Options are great to help in confidence for negotiation. Now, if you're going for a raise, you want the start of the conversation to be different. I always recommend having a reason to talk to the boss about your performance. So whether it's been scope creep, has, job creep has been going on, and gee, I want to make sure my, I'm prioritizing correctly, how things are going, what do you think of how I've been juggling the new responsibilities. They will tell you what you're doing well. If they're a good manager, they'll also tell you something you have to improve because that's what managers do. Do not put your tail between your leg at that moment. Continue with the discussion say, like, great, so glad you agree that I'm doing well. This is why I was surprised to find out that I'm so underpaid based on the market. And how can we fix that? The wording on that, it's keeping very collaborative again. It's a, that universal we. Um, and not saying you need to give me 15,000 more. It's here's what's happening. What do we do to fix it? Once the start is over, everything is the same, whether it's a raise or a new job. It pretty much works the same. Here is a great line when you just lost. You don't know what to say anymore. You get kind of exhausted by the whole thing. If you get to that point, most people don't. But if you feel like you need just a line in your pocket, I could say yes today if you can. And whatever you throw out in the if you can, make it amazingly aggressive. There's the story of Liz Taylor. I know, such an old, old reference. I apologize, but it's a great reference. She was the first actress to make a million dollars. And years and years ago, I think even before I was at Holy Cross, I saw her, some clip of her talking about it. She said, I didn't want to work, I was exhausted, so when they called to offer some movie to me, I just told my husband, tell them I'll do it if they pay me a million dollars, which she thought was off the chart crazy. And they said yes. So that's the mentality. You never know what's going to happen. Kind of have that. And all you're saying is I'll say yes today. You're not saying you're going to walk away from the offer. It just means you're going to be thinking about it more. But we can end this whole negotiation if you do. Make it whatever you really want. The weird thing about the negotiations, we our managers are there to help us, to make us successful. And they are at every other time in our career when we work for them. 
But during the actual negotiation, they are very much like a cop in every movie and every TV show getting the confession from a perp. They're not limited to the truth. So like a cop in you know, Law and Order or whatever, um, there is no DNA. There is no partner in crime singing in the other room. There is no witness. They're just saying those to make you talk. And here are the typical, not quite truthful statements that you will be hearing that you don't want to just believe. You can verify them or just kind of ignore them, which is what the language of the negotiation is that I do. Just ignore them. The first thing is you're going to be told your research is wrong. So instead of fighting, you know, your says 50,000, this says 30,000, lean into it. Great. My research is wrong. I just use the online stuff that's free. You're a big company. You have comp specialists. Tell me how you figured out what the offer would be. Walk me through it. Share the data. They're not going to do that for the most part, but you just called their bluff. Because their research is actually, they're just paying for a different version of salary.com. It's based on the exact same data. Um, and I've had clients actually find that out, you know, like when they said, sure, where'd you get your data? And they named literally the exact same places. So don't worry about that. Just call them. But once again, calm professionally. That's the best we can do, or we can't afford more. This is where researching the financials of your future employer or your current employer is important. It's important anyway, because if your company is about to go under, you don't want to go to them. If they say that to you, and you do actually currently work there now as an employee, I like kind of playing back with them. And in a very kind of soft, scared voice say, oh my gosh, should I be looking for a new job? Are we, are we closing? Call them on it. But then say, you know, that's so surprising to me because I saw that you have just closed a big contract with the government. Your profits have been increasing by X percent every year. Whatever, you're growing into new markets. Whatever it is that you discovered in your research, is what you want to mention here. It's surprising to me. Tell me more about that. How would my $5,000 more put you under the bank uh, in bankruptcy? I don't get it. And here are the different places publicly traded are very easy on the exchanges to do the research. Nonprofits, for those who don't know, they fill out an annual 990 form. Civic, it's just figuring out which group is actually having their budget. Private is the hard one. If you already work there, pay attention to the company meetings that you don't pay attention to. And the two people you want to pay attention to is the head of sales and the head of accounting or finance. Sales should be talking about these great things we just closed and everything's moving great. If they seem depressed, you should start thinking about maybe looking elsewhere. Um, if Accounting or finance is talking about EBITDA instead of profits and revenue. Then once that's another kind of um, bellwether moment to go, ooh, maybe start looking elsewhere. Not a good time to ask for a raise. So those are the ways to figure out the finances of the company and to overcome that, which is definitely going to be killed too. This one's great. Well, that would make you the highest, or you're the, already the highest, or that's more than I make, you managers may say. All very interesting, but have nothing to do with the fact that the market is paying more than what you're paying the job right now or what you offered me. So you acknowledge, hey, that's interesting, but the concern is that the pay is not on par with the current market this may need a salary adjustment. Salary adjustment is a really cool term. Keep this in your back pocket. It actually, it's more for when you're going for raises. A raise means you've done really well, we need to give you more money. A salary adjustment means the company did a poor job in figuring out what to pay you for your job, and they need to adjust it. It opens a whole new pocket of money. 
So that turn salary adjustment can come up and be very helpful. Wow, well, I've gone quick. I haven't shared all my stories. That's my problem today. Ending the negotiations. You want to do it in a very professional manner because the world is amazingly small. Uh, I live in Boston. You, know, you are going to trip over the same people. So whether you're negotiating and do not get to an agreement, you still need to be amazingly professional and polite. So thanks for working with me. Always sorry we didn't get to that agreement. Good luck in filling the job. For a current job and you're going for the raise, hey, thanks for working with me. Um, it's, it's disappointing that we didn't get to an agreement today. Then ask the key question, what needs to change to give a different income? If it's something you can control, like, well, you're not selling enough, or you didn't have a master's degree, or you are outperformed by everyone else in the department. If you know what you need to improve, go improve it, and then go have the conversation again. If it's something completely out of your control, it may be an indication that you're never going to get the race. And it's time to kind of look elsewhere. Because how it's set up in the world right now, people staying in their current employers, although employers say it's very important to retain employees, changing jobs is more often than not the only way to get a race in pay. Um, it's this bizarre thing, companies will set it up, and I hear it over and over again, that you need to, if, say you go to your manager and say, you know, I found out I'm greatly underpaid, what can we do about this? He or she may come back and say, well, you need to go get a job offer somewhere else before I'm allowed to offer you more. And that's a thing. It's a really disgusting thing, but it is a thing. If you get that, yeah. Go look for the job, but you'll probably find a job that is better suited for you and not going to make you jump through those hoops when you're ready for a raise the next time around. Should you be successful in your negotiation, which more often than not people are, the first offer truly is the first offer, so there's always $5, $10. There's something more there sitting for you to get just by raising your hand and having a few moments of uncomfortable conversation. So you'll get that. And the raises, the re most recent data I saw, it was over 70% of people who ask for a raise get it. So they're out there. You just need to know how to ask for them. When you get them, Get it in writing, sign the agreement, send an email to confirm. Just make sure there's something that pinpoints it, points down exactly what everyone's agreed to. So you're not saying yes and then something else happens later. And then to recap, negotiation and your career management go hand in hand. Really, it's helpful on both ends, so don't think of it as a separate entity when you're ever talking or thinking about what am I doing with my career. Incorporate the negotiation part into there. Know the value of the job. That's much more important than knowing yourself. Know the company's financials. And then you have to practice. Because you can say the absolute wrong thing, but if you sound comfortable and confident, You'll be more successful than saying the absolute right thing and having a kind of glitch in your voice, a little catch there, because if they hear that nervousness, that's where they kind of steamroll over you. So practice helps you get that phrasing down and you're more comfortable about it. Have some free stuff so you can get some more information on negotiating. There's a, a mini online course, some downloads, a they're focusing on the you factor. So you are part of the decision of what you should be made, what you should be paid. And learning how to talk about that, you know, your credentials, your impact is important. And that's where that focuses. That could be 
a session in and of itself. That's why I didn't go down that path today because it would take a lot of time. But here's a way for you to do that. And then we're uh, at the Q&A. Yes, we are. And we actually have quite a few questions, Katie, so I hope you're ready. Okay, ready. Uh, in no particular order, uh, we have one here that says, you, now that we know when to have that discussion in, in the job application process, once you've got the, once you've got the offer, who's the, person to, who's the best person to have that discussion with, the negotiation with? Is it the HR person? Is it the interviewer? Is it a headhunter ahead of time? Excellent question, and it can vary. So if you're working with a headhunter, it depends. Do you have a relationship with the headhunter that they're helping you find a job, or is it just the headhunter that you happen to contact because you're responding to a job advertisement? If you have a relationship with them, then use them as a consultant and say, like, look, here's what I'm being paid. I know I'm under market. We really need to get me to this other number, and you two should be putting together kind of a process of how we're going to maximize your income. Because remember, headhunters make money off of you. They want you to get a little more, if at all possible. If it's a headhunter that you're responding to a job offer, treat him just like you would the recruiter in the online application. You don't want to give away the store. You want to have the exact same responses about like, hey, um, I know I was underpaid. I'm not sure what I want to make on because it really depends on what the job is. You know, treat them that way. When you have the negotiation after the job offer, you want it with the person who owns the budget, which is typically whoever is your manager to be. Bigger companies do try to push you to the recruiter to have it, but you want to keep the actual manager in the loop. And I'll give you a horror story reason why. So a manager shared with this with me. She had a position that pays fifty three to sixty thousand. This is a few years back. And it's one of those that it's relatively entry level. She's always having turnover and she has about eight to ten people doing it at any one time. So it's something that she's constantly recruiting for. And some poor soul a woman happened to answer on the desired salary, 30000 for the job. And the recruiter in an instant, the internal recruiter in the company, wrote the offer letter for 30000 um, The manager didn't let it go out, and they had an internal fight for a couple of days. But the recruiter sometimes have a different goal. In this case, the recruiter was making bonus money based on the amount of money saved in each higher salary. So she was actually out to make sure, I mean, she was willing to pay under what was actually the approved range. So you want the, rec the actual manager who cares about you more than HR in the sense that their job gets easier when you actually start. So you want the manager is the short answer. <laughs> All right. Um, we've actually had several questions uh, around this next topic. Essentially, what happens, or do you have any tips on how to handle it when you're working in an industry that's where salaries are kind of regulated, whether it's uh, due to a union, uh, public sector? Uh, what's the best way to approach any kind of negotiation around salary in that instance? Okay, so everyone thinks if I'm unionized, I have no room for negotiation. Union stuff usually is, you know, year five, you have to give them a bump to, to a minimum of. The language more often than not is a minimum of. Or if they get a second degree, you give them, they get a bump in pay. If they do this, they get a bump in pay. And there's minimum set. You can still go and talk to your direct manager or whoever the point person is in that situation to get even higher. Case in point, I know of a lot of people working in school systems that have negotiated higher pay than what the union has got, have gotten them um, because they have a story. You know, they don't have to worry about the market. They don't have to worry about the ability to pay. 
what they're focused on is their individual story. Uh, it may be that they got their degree from an Ivy school, League school. It may be that they figured out a way to save the organization a million dollars. Um, you know, whatever the story is, they had it and they were able to get a little more than what was negotiated by the union. And the same is true with, if you work for the, um, like civic organizations, there's a lot of, well, you're, this is a level A1 slash Z whatever job. Sometimes just tweaking your title from straight on uh, administrator to senior administrator changes everything and you really did nothing differently. And that's what the negotiation is about. All right, uh, and we actually, we've gotten a bunch of questions related to this next idea, which is what's the best way to approach negotiating for things that are more benefits related, whether it's changing work hours, your work schedule, um, parental leave, uh, how do you, what's the best way to approach negotiating with the current employer about benefit related topics as opposed to salary? It's the same type of conversation. Um, that doesn't change that drastically. So if the benefits are you just know your life is at a point where you want to work home from home remotely for two days a week for whatever reason, you go in and you say, hey, how, do you agree I'm doing a great job? Great. I'm concerned I won't be able to continue doing such a great job unless we figure out a way for me to work remotely. Can we talk about that? I, you know, and, and then figure out the things. The thing about benefits, there's certain things that are just very stringent. You're not going to get a different medical package than the rest of the game. But flex stuff, you definitely can get different because by design they're meant to be created to make each an employee do their best, which means there's no one size fits all. Uh, same with leaves. If you want to leave, parental leave, whatever, know what the legal stuff is in your area, know what the company has, and then talk about what you're trying to get. But once again, don't be aggressive of this is what I need. Talk about how can we make this work, or sometimes it's the language they might not call it parental leave, but you'll still get the six months that you need away. All right, next question. I am a freelancer and I change jobs and often companies every six to nine months. How does this change how I should negotiate? Well, as a freelancer, technically you're kind of your own boss. So you can set what your rates are. I don't do anything less than $100 an hour. or. Um, if you're responding to what they have, you can do the research in the kind of the backwards way of saying that's an interesting offer, but here's what's keeping me from saying yes. And you might find that, say they're offering you $100 an hour, but in your research it's showing that that's what the going rate is for an actual employee. That's the case as a freelancer, you're not getting all the benefits, so you should be getting about 125 an hour because it's about 20 to 25 percent uptick on benefits. But once again, you want to be negotiating with the person who has the actual money, the person who's hiring you, the manager. All right, here's one. How can I let my current employer know that I've had people asking me to consider other job offers without seeming like I'm threatening the employer? Interesting question. I get this one a lot. It, it's kind of, you just slip it in to conversation without it being a conversation about that. So it may be of what's going, what's going on in the industry or what's going on at one of your competitors. And you say, well, you know what, when a headhunter called me a little while back about that company, he told me. And you just got your whole point across without actually being aggressive about it, that you're a wanted commodity and you just added money to yourself by doing that. All right, next question. How do you handle the pay question when you're currently out of work? Um, 
I'm not sure what the question is. Are we talking about desired pay or what you're currently probably, making? Probably <laughs> currently, probably, I would imagine this is what currently making. So when they ask you, what are you currently being paid? Well, you're, you're out of work, so you don't have to worry about that. But the same thing on previous jobs. Because when you fill out a job application, they don't stop at your current job. They want to know your history of jobs, and they want to know what you're making at each of the jobs. And you're going to leave that blank for each of your jobs. So if you're currently un unemployed, whether it's for a week or a year or longer, you don't want your last job to be the pay they see either. Just keep all of that blank. OK. Uh, here's one. Uh, I work in sales. Often the job I'm applying for asks to look at my W-2s. How should I respond? Um, for those in Massachusetts and California and New York City is about to file a bill too, there's a movement that the question of what your previous pay was should end. It's so biased it's beyond belief. Um, so hopefully in a couple of years we won't even be having this discussion. But if they don't trust you for what you said, that's the response. Really, I, I'm having difficulty knowing if I want to work for a company who already is challenging me before I even work for them. And once again, you've you got to kind of say it in a sweet, non-aggressive way, even though you should be seething. Because that's what they're saying. We don't trust you. We assume you're lying to us when you said you made a uh, sold a million dollars and made two hundred and fifty thousand in salary plus commission. Okay. And you have issues with that. Yeah. Good point. Uh, all right. So we've had a couple questions about how you handle it when uh, you're having managers are adding more duties to your current job that were not. Uh, that were not originally in there. Right, that's what's called job creep, yeah. or at least that's what I call it. I say the first step is to sit down and write your new job description. What am I actually doing? Because your boss doesn't realize it. Well, you think they do, but they more often than not really don't, because they just handed you something one day and another, and it just kind of happened. It's like gaining weight. It was announced this week and a pound that week, and all of a sudden you're 20 pounds overweight. They don't get that. So you need to write exactly, here's what I'm doing, and then pull your actual job description from when you got hired or what's on the books now. And say, like, you think I'm doing this, but here's what I'm doing, and based on my research, this is actually instead of um, a marketing manager's role, it's a marketing director's role. So one, I would like to talk about getting me the correct title and then to the correct compensation for it. Or if you want, I can go back and do a marketing manager, but that means all this stuff I'm actually doing, what are you going to do with that? All right. Um, here are a couple of, a few more. I hate to do this to you, Katie. We've got several more. I'm going to try to fit them all in. Um, one person says, I'm, I'm currently being considered for two jobs. Uh, with a new employer. How can I negotiate if they allow me to choose between the two? Okay, so it's the same employer. Mm -hmm. And they have, oh, you could fit us, you might fit us doing partnerships, and you might fit us doing internal, internal communications, and they're slightly different. Um, so f first, which job do you really want is part of the consideration. Which are they, uh, it's, uh, they won't offer you both. Somewhere along the line, unless they're totally different managers and they're fighting for you. And then have fun and let them fight. And say like, well, let's agree that both of you give me an offer by Friday and by Wednesday I will give you a decision. Because that's going to up it. Actually, I'll use a housing example on this. I just sold, well, I'm in the process of selling my condo. And what we did, and this is what you can do, is you can create a bidding war, is we had one weekend of open house. So three days, each day, an hour and a half, open house, people come, people go. And they were all told offers had to be in by Monday at 6. 
and that I would make a decision by Tuesday at some time. And just doing that alone, only one offer came in at asking. Everything was above. And we were able to go back and say, you're the lead offer, but here's a sticking point, and do a little more negotiation within kind of the benefits part. It wasn't the actual pay, but the benefits part, and get, get it to where we wanted it. So you can do the same thing if they're different managers with their different budgets wanting you, and they're fighting amongst themselves. Let them fight, sit back, and enjoy it. So like, great, both of you give me your offers. I'll make a decision based on that. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Uh, there was a question about how to handle negotiations when you're a candidate for an internal position uh, and at a company where their position grades. And basically, this person is asking if, in your experience, is there much flexibility and opportunity for significant negotiation when there are such policies in place? Yes. Every time they tell you there's no room for negotiation, there's room for negotiation. There is absolutely room for negotiation. It may be, as I said before, titles. You can adjust you know, what the title is for you to get higher pay. They more often than not, here's the problem, once you're in there, you're in there as an ABC making 50000 let's just say, and you're going to um, try to get a DEF job, and that only can... Regardless of what the range is on that, they're looking at, well, she's making 50 or he's making 50 now. We're only going to bump it a certain amount. And that's where the conversation is you understanding the range and saying, like, it can't be based on my previous pay because it doesn't have anything to do with what this current job is that I'm going for and what the range is there. If you're already making above, you, you want to kind of say, well, what about changing levels within the organization? There is always someone making more than you think. All right. Um, and uh, in the couple minutes that we have left, um, here's mm -hmm. one that says, what advice, this, we received this question from a lot of people, what advice do you have for recent grads who have not yet established themselves professionally uh, and uh, especially the importance of negotiating not just salary but benefits? Um, my advice to everyone, no matter where you are in your career, no matter new, about to retire, changing careers, doing the same thing a million days, you need to absolutely positively be dissatisfied with whatever the first offer is, whatever the first raise is, whatever the first promotion new amount is, and have the negotiation conversation. Focusing on market gives you the most flexibility on that conversation. Focusing on yourself, especially as a new young employee, only hurts you. Focus on market. That helps you greatly. OK. Um let me try to squeeze in two more quick ones, quick ones if you've got quick answers. Uh, one is, it, are you, if you are aware of a gender pay, cap, pay gap at your employer, can you bring that into the negotiations, or is it a faux pas to bring up other people's salaries? No, it's a legal stick of dynamite. Do not ever say those words. They're going to shut up and get their lawyers, and you're just in holy hell. Focus on the market. Okay. And you said a performance review is the worst time to negotiate a raise. Uh, why and when should a pay raise be negotiated with your current employer? So the annual review tends to be done by bigger companies. They tend to set those budgets three to six months beforehand, and they're usually 3% cap. So there's very little wiggle room to get anything. That budget is dried up by the time you're having the conversation. They're offering you 2%, you might be able to get 3%. Great, but it's not changing your life. Any other time, literally any other time but then, is better opportunity because you're not fighting the fight against your manager just trying to fill out forms and get all his 10 employees over and done with in a month. And you have their time and he, ha he or she has access to budget that. 
And it may be that they need to put it in for next year's budget, and you can ask for retroactive since you're having the conversation in October, but the budget doesn't kick in until January. You know, that might be something. But that moment in time of the actual performance review, great practice, don't expect too much in results. All right. Um, that's basically all the time we have for answering questions. I think we got to most of them. Um, Katie's contact information is up on the screen, and I want to thank her for sharing her time and her knowledge with us today. Um, if you happen to miss this contact information, just email me here in the alumni office. I also want to thank you for joining us. A recording of this presentation will be available on the Holy Cross Alumni Career Development website by early next week, and I will send out an email when it's posted. You'll also receive a short email survey about today's webinar, and I encourage you to share your feedback with us. If you have any follow-up questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Our webinar series will pick up again in September with a presentation on navigating career transitions. So be on the lookout for more information, which will be sent out in August. Again, thanks to Katie. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and have a great afternoon.